Hello, my friends. Welcome to my corner. It was incredibly 10 years ago that I read Selma Lagerlöf for the first time. She was really one of those authors who interested me a lot, but for some reason she was one of the last Nobel laureates that I read as part of that Nobel Prize project that I have told you about so many times before. I had a copy of her Niels Holgersson books. I have this one right here from the UK. And I also have one from when I was a kid, so I have the little uh, abbreviated version of that story. But I wanted to experience her work for adults first, and it seemed to me that the consensus was that it was the saga of Josta Berling that was her most important adult-oriented novel. So back then I read a library copy of this book, but for all of those years I wanted to have my own copy, and I showed you this one in a book haul that I did like half a year ago now because it was in the summer of last year and I told you in that book haul that I wanted to reread it and share my ideas with you and it looks like that is finally happening so we'll see what we have here what I'm gonna say in this introduction is that I enjoyed reading the saga of Josta Berling this time even more than I enjoyed it the first time so that is already something wonderful to be able to say so let me tell you first a little bit about Selma Lagerlöf and then we can move on to talk about her works and about this book in particular. Lagerlöf was born in Värmland, which is a very important place because it's important to her work in the year 1858 and she died also in Sweden in 1940. She has been described as a feminist and as a pacifist and I think that is fair. She was also a teacher and the saga of Justa Berling was her first novel, amazingly, because it was really an instant success. Now, in the, in the aspect of uh, world literature, or at least at, at the world level, the one that she is most famous for are the two books of Niels Holgersson. These were meant to be geography readers for children. But as tends to happen with children's literature, they became so much more than that. So Lockerlöf was the first woman to receive the Nobel Prize in Literature. That happened in the year 1909. And she received it, quote, in appreciation of the lofty idealism, vivid imagination, and spiritual perception that characterize her writings. I think it's very interesting, uh, as was the case with Gabriela Mistral, um, what she did with the money from that she received from the Nobel Prize what she did was that she bought back uh, her childhood home the home that had belonged to her parents the name of that place is Morbakia and she was really really attached to this place connected to it and when she got the money for for the Nobel Prize she was able to buy this place back and live there for the rest of her life. I thought that was wonderful. I can really connect to that because I have a very, very close connection, for example, to my grandmother's house uh, when I was back in Argentina. I think if I ever had a lot of money, if I ever won the Nobel Prize in Literature, that's, that's exactly what I would do. I would buy that house and then I would just live happily ever after in that place. Here's another interesting thing about Locker Luff. She was instrumental in helping the poet Nelly Sachs to emigrate to Sweden when she was escaping the Nazis. And actually, Nelly Sachs went to Sweden in the last plane that, that left Germany at that time. And you may know how the story continues. Nelly Sachs would eventually become a Nobel laureate too. So what do you think? Am I going to talk about her one of these days? You can be sure of that, my friend. So that's in the future, but let's not get ahead of ourselves here. I want to share with you, before we look at uh, the saga of Josta Berling, some features of the work of Selma Lagerlöf. I have a book here by Walter Berenson of the University of Hamburg titled Selma Lagerlöf, Her Life and Work. And it's very interesting in itself, though it's a little bit older. This is from... Um, it was first published in 1931, so we are talking something from quite a while ago. But it has a very interesting preface by Vita Sackville-West that I think will give us a good introduction to the themes and the poetics of Lagerlöf and uh, what you can find in her works. So the first thing that she points out is that what you can find in the work of Lagerlöf is a mixture of the landscape of Sweden and the escape that fairy tales provide. So in other words, you have great realism and great 
fantasy. Vita Sagdo West says that Logger Love is basically the best of both worlds. So that is one thing. The next one that she mentions is that there is also a great sense of romanticism to the work of Logger Love. And actually, um, here is something that uh, she says that I thought was interesting. Reading Josta Berling, admirable as is the juggling between romance and naturalism, one cannot help regretting that Selma Lagerlöf should have been born in the 19th instead of in the 9th century. Then she would have been forced into no compromise. She could have indulged her romanticism to the full. So I think that speaks for itself. After that, she also says that Lagerlöf is a poet writing in prose. I could not agree more with that assessment. I think that is exactly the way that I would describe her. Her prose is just very poetic. And finally, she describes Lagerlöf as feminine. I think this is also very important. Let me read you that last part of her preface right here. She says, let us add too that she writes always as a woman. Not one of her books could have been written by a man. Her art is essentially feminine, not masculine, yet without the slightest consciousness of sex. In that, one is especially glad to remember how the Swedish Academy have honored her. So just a little bit about Logan Love by Vita Sackville West that I think helps us put things into context. Now let me tell you a little bit more concretely about the saga of Justa Berling. This was published in 1891, and as the title suggests, it really revolves around the figure of a certain Justa Berling. When we meet him at the beginning of the text, he is a minister, and he is beloved by his people. He's a very good pastor, but he has a little problem. Every hero has to have a problem, right? So his problem is that he likes to drink a little bit too much. So what happens to him is that he is defrocked and he becomes a wanderer for a while he gets very depressed it's he's almost in the, on the brink of suicide until a majoress makes him a cavalier and takes him to her estate the estate of Ekeby, which is connected to an iron works this is the way that this area uh, make their their living the people who live there so Yosta joins 11 other cavaliers who live in this place these are veterans uh, from the Napoleonic wars and basically the, the the story here the saga of Josta Berling follows the fates and the exploits of these cavaliers who if I wanted to sum up their their life this is basically it they're just dedicated to wine women and song and the the story really plunges us in, into a world that is just rich with romance and with legend that is one way that I could describe this text so let's talk about now a little bit uh, genre and uh, structure because I think this is an aspect that makes this book very interesting. I would describe the saga of Justa Berling as an episodic novel. We have 36 episodes, 36 chapters, and then there are a couple of preface chapters, so I guess we are talking about a total of 38 episodes or chapters in exactly 400 pages. Now many of these chapters, or basically all of them really, you can read them individually. They're independent pieces. But I wouldn't say that they're exactly short stories. You know what I'm saying? They're more like vignettes. This is more like a mosaic. So each of these vignettes basically illuminate the important aspects of the land and its people. So that's what I mean when I say that we have a mosaic right here. And of course, if you look at the title, right, and the story itself, you have the figure of Josta Berling at the center of most of these vignettes. But there are some of them in which he is not even mentioned, especially towards the latter half of the novel. So that is also something that you want to keep in mind. Yes, it is about Justa Berling, but there are many episodes that deal with other characters and sometimes not even characters, but maybe aspects of the land. It is really the setting, which is Vermland, that I was mentioning before, that provides the most important kind of unity to this text. Let me read you a little bit more from this uh, book by Berenson because uh, he talks also about the structure and I think he has some important points that we can highlight right here. So he says, Selma Logerlöf gives her work the form of a chain in which each chapter is a separate link. Sometimes the individual adventures have no direct bearing on the plot. The book flows on like a river 
which here and there expands into a quiet lake. I really like that description right there. And then a couple of pages later, um, he continues to talk about the structure of the novel. He says, the close warp and woof of the main action made it possible for Selma Lagerlöf to put in many chapters which do not further the plot. At first reading, the wealth of incidents and characters may seem so great as to obscure the main issue. On repeated reading, one sees more and more clearly the artistry of the weaving, the delightful variation of passionate onrush and comforting pauses, of moving pathos and restrained humor. An inexhaustible wealth of experience has found expression within the wide yet well-defined limits of the form. And he adds something that really does not have anything to do with the genre or the structure, but I still wanted to mention it because I thought it was an interesting comparison. He says, Josta Berling's saga has no exact parallel in English literature, but there burns in it the same passionate intensity which glows through the pages of Jane Eyre. So let me highlight now four themes that I think are prominent in this novel. The first one is chivalry. When I was reading the saga of Josta Berling, I kept thinking about the legends of King Arthur and his knights. I even see the saga of Josta Berling as a kind of a meta-text of uh, Arthurian legend. The second point, or the second theme, is the concept of nostalgia. This is, of course, closely related to the idea of chivalry, but I would say that there's a kind of a yearning for the medieval throughout this novel. That is probably what Vita Sackville West had in mind when she said that Lagerlöf should have been born in the 9th century instead of the 19th. But uh, that yearning for the medieval, you know, a time that we associate with chivalry, that is what I mean by this nostalgia that I found in this novel. The third theme uh, that I would like to highlight is the idea of folklore. Okay, this is a novel that is just suffused with the elements of folk tales, the stories basically that Lagerlöf heard when uh, she was a child, primarily from her grandmother and from her aunt. There's a book uh, that she wrote titled Christ Legends, and that book begins by, it's a collection of stories, and she begins by saying uh, how she remembers very little of her grandmother. She remembers her death, of course, but the first thing or the most important thing that she remembers of her grandmother is that, is that she told uh, stories. So she was the first storyteller that Lagerlöf encountered in her life. And then after that, it was her aunt Ottilia. And all of these stories, the stories that are included in this novel, the saga of Josta Berling, come from these women in Lagerlöf's life. And then finally, the fourth theme that I wanted to mention is the land. When you read the works of Selma Lagerlöf, you can tell that she has great love for her land, in particular Vermland, which is the place where the saga of Josta Berling and many of her other works take place. So this is something that you can see also in her work on uh, Niels Holgersson, right? Because this was a geography reader for children, so she has that love of the land that is visible here in this one also. And if you look at the saga of Josta Berling, there's a chapter, it's chapter 4, and it's titled The Landscape. That is one chapter in which you can see clearly. Uh, actually, that is chapter one, not chapter four. But the first chapter after the prologue, uh, titled The Landscape, you can see clearly that love of the land. For example, in this chapter, there is a place in which the hills are speaking, like literally. They are literally given a voice. And you find other places throughout this novel where that kind of thing happens. And you can tell that the land is really a character in itself. And I think that's just a wonderful aspect of this novel. But at the center, as we said before, we have the figure of Josta Berling. He is our protagonist, he is our hero, so I think we should say a couple of words about him. The stories that are told here are really captivating, but the most captivating thing about this novel, besides the land and the things that we mentioned before, it's really the magnetic figure of this hero, okay? I would describe uh, Josta Berling as impulsive, as irresistible, poetic, and I would also say that he is neither good nor evil. That's a good thing to have right here. We don't have any Manichaeism here in this novel. So we learn about Josta Berling through his actions, of course, as we learn about any uh, character, but also we learn about him through the effect that he has on the people around him, the characters around him, especially women, because it's women who find Josta irresistible. Now, uh, the saga of Josta Berling is the title, but one thing that caught my attention is that the narrator doesn't really get inside the head of her characters, especially of Josta, 
the way that you would expect by the title of the novel. We don't hear things a lot from his perspective. And as a result of that, something wonderful happens, and it's that the character is really surrounded by an aura of mystery. At the beginning of the novel, we are even told that he may or may not have something to do with the death of a young woman. So you see what I mean? There's a mystery around him, and I think there are many aspects of the character and the personality of Josta Berling that we are not meant to find out about. That is what makes the character interesting, among many other things. There are many important characters. We have the 12 cavaliers, so 11 cavaliers beside Josta Berling. But I wanted to mention two characters that I thought were particularly well developed. One of them is Elizabeth. She is Josta Berling's most important love interest. He has many women that he gets involved with, but Elizabeth is really one of the most important ones, if not the most important. That's what I believe, at least. So uh, the portrayal of this character, I think, may be one of those things that Vita Sackville West had in mind when she said that this is a feminine novel. It shows really the understanding of women and how this novel, as, as Vita Sackville West said, could not have been written by a man. So one of the most important plot elements in this novel, if you are looking for plot beyond this idea of the vignettes that we have that make up uh, Josta Berling's saga, has to do precisely with the relationship between Josta and Elizabeth, the effect that he has on her also. And the novel, we have to keep in mind, is not really structured in any traditional way around that story, but that story is still a very important part of it. And then the other character that I feel is very well characterized, and I think this is one of the triumphs of this novel, is the character of the demonic Syndrome. He is the owner of a mill, and this is the way that he is described. Uh, you can find this on page 249. So Syndrome is described as lover of darkness without mourning, of death without resurrection, of winter without spring. So I think that is that is really uh, an amazing description of him. And there's another part here where he is described. Let me see if I can find the description of him. It's on page 251. And here it says, And everyone felt that if he had a bundle of lightning bolts in his hand, he would have hurled them in wild delight out over the calm countryside and spread misery and death as far as he was able. For now he had so accustomed his heart to evil that he knew no joy other than in misery. Little by little he had learned to love everything ugly and base. He was crazier than the wildest lunatic, but no one realized this. So if you're talking about a book that has this idea of folk tales to it, you have to have an evil guy, and Sintram is it, and he's just very well constructed as a character. The next thing that I want to do is I want to share with you six episodes, okay? So six of these chapters that you could read independently that I think are particularly well done. Uh, the question here is why six? Why not five or three or seven? You know, one of those nice numbers. I just grabbed the most important ones and they just happen to be six of them. So that's the only reason why I'm going for that number here. The first one is chapter four titled Josta Berling, the Poet. This one has a really good sense of chivalry, right? The, the idea of chivalry, you can see it here because Josta is going to fetch Anna so that she can come back to the estate and marry the man that she is actually supposed to marry. So you can see a little bit here of the effect that Josta has on this character of Anna. And I think a very important part of this character is that he is referred to as a poet even though he has never written a single line of poetry. So that is actually something that he says here on page 52. So he says, I have many sins on my conscience, but I have never written a line of poetry. And the captain's wife answers, you are still a poet, Josta. You will have to bear that nickname. You have lived more poems than our poets have written. So that is part of the idea why he is per perceived as a poet. So chapter 4 is important to me. Chapter 15 is another one that I wanted to highlight, and it's titled The Paths of Life. This one has to do more with nature and with folklore. So we are looking for connections here with those themes that I shared with you before. That would be it. And in this one you see the cavaliers repairing a dam because the water has basically run out of control. You hear about the waves here being personified, just as the hills were in that previous chapter that I told you about. There's a sea witch, or at least 
that is what Yusta thinks. So you can see how that develops in the story. And what I like about this part is also that the narrator addresses the reader. She actually tells us in this part that these stories came to her from the past. Another thing that she will do as a narrator is to address the characters. It was very common in this time period to address the reader, but addressing the characters, I think, also gives a great, great uh, connection right there between the narrator and her creation. Chapter 19, I also liked. It's titled The Witch of Dovre. This is about folklore also, and basically what happens to people when they are not kind to witches, which is not a very good idea. You know, if you're talking to a witch and they ask you for something, then you better do what they're saying. Otherwise, you're going to get in trouble. Chapter 24. This is titled The Clay Saints, and that is the one chapter that I remember very clearly from the time that I had read this novel, like 10 years ago. So this one was probably the one that made the most powerful impression on me. In this chapter, uh, the Count is basically renovating the church, and he decides to take the clay figures of the saints and throw them into the lake. So after that, things get interesting, the cavaliers get involved, and there's a sense of justice and propriety, I would say, to this uh, chapter. It really shows you how the cavaliers interpret these two concepts and how they act according to them. Chapter 29 is one of those chapters that can basically be read as a perfect short story. It's titled The Drought, and it's basically the story of how the people of the town ask God why he is punishing them with this drought. Like, what did they do? And they decide that it's the minister's fault. So what they do is they start throwing dry sticks into the minister's yard as a way to signal that this is the person who is guilty, this is the person who is responsible, and the person who should be punished as a result. So then at one point, Yosta comes in, and he sits with the minister, and he sympathizes with him, which makes perfect sense, because remember that Yosta is also a minister, a de defrocked one, but he can understand, you know, a minister who has fallen into a miserable state. So I really liked uh, that chapter right there. And one thing that I could see in this chapter 29, titled Drought, about the novel is something that I haven't mentioned before, and that is that there's a big sense of paganism to the saga of Yosta Berling. And when I say that, I mean paganism in the full sense of the word. If you look at the etymology of the word pagan, it basically means of the town, right? Of the village, of the country, as opposed to the city. And related to that, look at what you find on page 315. This is something that the narrator tells us. So the narrator says, Anyone who wishes to see the context of things must go away from cities and live in a solitary hut at the forest edge. He must see that when there is anxiety on the earth, the peace of the dead things is disturbed. The people know that. It is in such times that the wood nymphs put out the charcoal pile, the sea witch breaks apart the boat, the water sprite sends sickness, the gnome starves the cow. And so it was this year. So that's what I mean when I say paganism. I, I mean it in the etymological sense of the word, and this idea that the cities are different, right? And finally, the last chapter that I wanted to emphasize as a good one to check out, if you want to just sample the saga of Josta Berling, that would be chapter 33, which is titled Kevin Hüller. This is the name of a character. This is another chapter that really works very well as a short story, and this character of Kevin Hüller is an inventor who meets a nymph, okay, a wood nymph, and this wood nymph just so happens to be able to grant uh, wishes. And what she does for Kevin Hewler is to give him basically the gift of genius. But as always, whenever you have in a folktale a gift or something similar to that, you also have a catch, right? In this case, the catch is that Kevin Hewler can produce wonderful things, but he can also produce one of each. So if he comes up with a great invention, he's only going to be able to make one of those. Then he has to invent another wonderful thing, and it's going to be another, just one of those. And it continues like that. So I think it's a good old story about the tears that are shed over answered prayers, which is something that you also find a lot of in uh, folktales. There's a film version 
of the saga of Josta Berling. It's from 1924, so it's a silent film by Moritz Stiller, who was a Finnish uh, filmmaker, but he produced movies in uh, Sweden. And the interesting thing about this film is that it's the movie that actually launched the career of Greta Garbo. And it was actually Stiller who brought Greta Garbo to the US where she was discovered by the studios right here. So the film, I'm not going to talk a lot about it because I am actually watching it right now. I'm right in the middle of it and I'm enjoying it very much. But I do want to say that so far in the first half, the first part of this movie, I have not really encountered a lot of the fantasy elements that you can find in the novel from the very start. I think the film is a much more traditional narrative. And that is one thing that I want to say about the saga of Josta Berling. You can take this novel and rewrite it in a more traditional way, in a way that has a more traditional structure. But honestly, I believe that there wouldn't be much to it if you did that. I think it's actually, you know, the exorbitant form that this novel has. All, all the parts that stick out that make it really interesting. If you told it or retold it as a traditional story, I don't think it would be the same novel in the first place, of course, but I also don't think the story itself would be that interesting. So, the bottom line. The saga of Josta Berling really took me to a wonderful place. That is the first thing that I like about this book. You know how some books just transport you? That is exactly what happened to me with this novel. And I have the same experience whenever I read the stories of King Arthur and his knights. So I think I made that connection between the saga of Josta Berling and the Arthurian legends, not only because of the topic, not only because of the themes of chivalry and all that, but because of the effect that it had on me. So it's really a very subjective thing that I'm doing right here. Apart from that, I would say that uh, Lagerlöf's poetic style really has no equal, and that is one of the things that I appreciate about this book also. The descriptions here, it's really like reading a poem, and I absolutely love that when an author gives me poetry in prose. I want to read more by her. One thing that I would like to do is to tell you my experience with the adventures of Niels Holgersson, so we can uh, look forward to that one of these days. But I also want to explore other books by her, other books that she wrote for adults, just so that I can be able to compare the saga of Josta Berling to those other novels or collections of stories that she was famous for. If you do decide to read the saga of Josta Berling, please let me know what you think, because this is one of those books that not many people read. and I I would love to hear other impressions on it. So, do you have any questions, comments, recommendations, recipes? Just let me know. Those were my two cents on the saga of Josta Perling by Selma Dolgerlof. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.